Good morning, everybody. Welcome to day one of the USAS R basic training. Sorry, I meant to have that up. Here is the agenda. Today we'll be going over the home core and transaction and then day two and three are also listed. Please feel free to either send us a chat or unmute yourself if you have questions. I'll try to watch the time and take a break at a good time around maybe 1015. And we'll be recording these sessions the next few days. So if your coworkers could not make it or you want to review this, you can find the link on the training and registration page where you registered for the session and even watch it later. So let's go to that page and start on the wiki. <clears throat> <clears throat> Under meetings and trainings, this is where you registered, but down here under the training materials, here's the overview training. So if you click on that, here's the agenda that I just showed you. And then the PowerPoint that will be going, I'm not going to use this PowerPoint today, I'm going to actually be in the instance but everything in this PowerPoint is definitely in today's session or this week's sessions, um, plus more. Like some of the new releases will be included in the live um, training. There's some exercises here. It, this is the link for the user manual and then, then the appendix. One thing I do want to show you though, in the appendix, there is um, an FAQ section and it's categorized by some of these menu options that we're gonna be going through like the transactions um, menu options. So if you click on purchase orders, you might have a question that falls under the purchase orders. Same way with the error messages categorized, like if you get an error when you're processing a purchase order, it might be one of these. So that's kind of handy too. But for today, we're going to start on the home page. As you log in, this is what it looks like. <clears throat> um, this week, we'll be going through all these menu options and all that's below it. Today, we're going to focus on the home page, the core menu, and the transaction items under here. Um, the menu options that you see depend on the user's access. And so some of these menus that may look different to like a read-only user. And for the purpose of these trainings, I'll have admin access so that I can show you all the menu options that are available. All right, so when you start, you're logged, you just log in and you come to this home page. On the left side, you see these template reports that the user has access to, or just the ones that they've like bookmarked as favorites. And we'll show you how to do that, but it's basically clicking and saving it as a favorite report. And the reason why you would want to do that is because maybe I run the cash summary every day. So instead of going to the report menu and going through the list, it's saved as a favorite, just like a bookmark on Google would be. So that makes redesign very customizable to the you, uh, to the district or the user. Also, our user is going to see the current posting period. Currently, we are in February. So all the transactions that I process will uh, influence the month-to-date totals for February on the accounts and reports. So the user, all users will see this in the upper right corner, but they'll have just their access to the menu options or report options. 
also on the screen, this tells you the application, application health. You probably will not be oops, using that. But here's a help button as well. Underneath is the about. It gives you the current application version and we're constantly upgrading or releasing releases. And then sometimes as you submit a help ticket, we'll ask you to send the server log and under that help about menu, this is where you would do it. You would just click on the send server log to SSDT. Also in the help is the public or the documentation. So every user has access to this user guide and it is all the menu options that we'll be covering this week, like the core menu options and the transaction menu options. So that's handy. And the public USAS reports library. These are users created these and have customized them and now they're accessible to all users across the state. <clears throat> they are categorized as account-based reports, budgeting reports, and I'm not gonna scroll through all of these, but transaction-based reports, vendor reports, and periodic reports like the workers comp. So all you would do, say you want to use this PO detail vendor report, this column, this column gives you a description. This gives you an example of the report. If you want that report, and we'll show you this more in the days to come, but I wanted to show you this because these reports are available. You would download this JSON file and upload it to the system. So that's the help menu. And we're going to start with the core menu and go to the accounts. The core menu is basically the maintenance or setup type menu options like your, where you set up your accounts, your bank accounts, your delivery addresses, um, things like that. So we're gonna start with accounts. This is your account page. And you can see on the top, you have five tabs, fund, cash, appropriation accounts, expenditure accounts, and revenue accounts. So this is classics account screen, basically or in USAS web, it would be under accounts. And you see it's in grid style. The fund tab, um, the funds available on the fund tab grid come from the cash accounts, which we'll talk about next. Um, they come from the cash accounts created and displayed on the cash grid. And on all these grids throughout the system, you'll see these similar icons, as well as if you hover over things, sometimes there's tooltips. So the eyeball is view, the pencil is edit. And we're gonna view the general fund. And I'm gonna edit it just because it makes it darker so easier to see. Now, this is one thing that I love about the redesign. These little boxes, you can just move it. So hopefully that's more in the middle of the screen for you guys. You can just move it out of the way if you need to. So at the bottom are your general fund grand totals. Now under the general fund, you could have like different special cost centers like 001, 9921, 001, 9922. But this being under the fund is the grand total of all. 
and the district can customize this. They can put the fund description in whatever they want to call it. Generally, it's the general fund. You can, the user can choose to include it in the resolution or not. If it's checked mark like this general fund is, fund is, then it will be included in the reports found under the periodic menu, like the certification reports and the appropriation resolution reports. This is how you want those certificate reporting to be sorted by. The user can choose it by just fund only or the fund special cost center. And here is where you can check or uncheck and set the resolution levels that you want to report. In classic, I believe you had to choose these every time you ran the um, appropriation resolution report. Here you can set it and, <coughs> excuse me, it's a one-time setup and then it'll remember these options. So the next tab, well, here's another tip too. When these pop-up boxes, there's a, if you can't see something to the right, this isn't a good example, but this little plus sign expands it and then the minus sign. So if you ever run into that and you can't see something to the right or something, you can do that. <coughs> Next, we're gonna go to the cash fund. <clears throat> so on this cash, cash special cost grid, you'll see all the fund special cost centers or what we call the cash account. There's different columns. On these grids throughout the system, you can um, move them, like uh, change the size of them. You can drag and drop and reorganize, like if you want your active over here. And then resize. And I'm gonna give you those tips all the way through <clears throat> as we go along. Also on this grid, there's a more button. And as you see, the tooltip says more columns. Right now, the check marks are the columns on this report. But any of these options are available. The only thing that we um, remind users or should remind users that these calculated figures like month to date received, fiscal year to date unencumbered, all those calculating fields the more of those you have on this grid, the slower the grid may be. And that's throughout the system, but. So I wanted to touch on that. I am gonna uncheck just for speed, the, uh, the encumbrance. And we'll do the fund balance. We also have a report button up here. So anything that's on your grid, um, go back to the cash. Anything that's displayed on the grid, you can get a report from or on. You would just click that button. And generate the report. So that's handy. And say you did for one time have a lot of those calculating totals um, and you just wanted to clear the grid and start all over, you can, there's a reset button that you can click and it'll go back to the default. There is an advanced query button to further sort your grid. And I'll show you an example of this, I believe today. And then you can also sort with these like arrows at the top of the columns.
So next I'm gonna go over these icons. And again, the eyeballs view, the pencils edit and delete. You can only delete a cash account tab if there are no related accounts, transactions or adjustments related to that account. We are going to view 001. And again, I can type whatever I need in the top two. Uh, Once you're in the cash account, you have the ability to edit the account, which I'm gonna do so it becomes darker. Oh wait, you can clone the cash account. You can make adjustments. So as I edit it, you can change the description if you want. And there are, this would be your active or inactive status. If it's saved without a check mark, if it's active, you check mark it. This would, is the user's choice whether to include this in the um, five year forecast. This check mark whether to include this cash account in like the certificate reporting. And the start and stop dates, which you notice can pop up with a little calendar, but you can also enter dates such as that. Um, the requires budgeting. When this is checked, it requires the balance checking on the associated budget and appropriation accounts. So, a requisition will not be posted if it causes the associated appropriation and budget accounts to go negative. And if this is unchecked, this enables users who otherwise are unable to exceed the budget balances, and it allows them to exceed these balances for this particular fund only. And then you see the totals just for the 001 special cost center 0000. So the fund was the grand total. It breaks it down to the cash account. And then next we're gonna go to appropriation account. The appropriation accounts are the expenditure accounts used by the school district when they're audited. Um, it's used to track the estimated and actual expenses incurred by the school district. And depending on the user's access, they may not be able to create this type of an account. But you see similar options on the grid as before. And we're gonna create an appropriation account. Again, I'm gonna move this to the middle, oops. These buttons up here, um, if I have three accounts that I want to add and I want this button or this pop-up box to continually pop up for the next one to be added, I would check that. So then when I save this, after I enter this data and I click save, it'll pop up the next blank one to add. If I'm only adding one, which I'm gonna do today, I'm gonna click close. So when I click save, after I enter the data, it'll close that box. So I'm gonna add a grant fund. And I'm just going to call it grant fund. I can enter a start date or use the calendar. Same with the stop date. I want to make it active. Um, a note about the start date, though. 
when the start date is entered on the appropriation account, um, it will become active on that date. So if I have it set for April Fool's Day, this appropriation account, as well as it, their, the underlining expenditure accounts won't become active until um, April 1st. When there's a stop date in here, again, the underlying expenditure accounts will become inactive on September 30th, 2022, and it won't let any processing against those accounts. So if a user is, um, as they're processing a requisition and trying to pick out an account and they're not seeing that account, I would come and check the start and stop dates. Maybe that's why they're not being available on the user's drop down screen when entering a transaction. And the other thing would be the active status. So again, once I click save, because I have that checked. Oh, well, this is a good example of an error. Sometimes you get an error and it looks like this fund was already in the system. It says duplicate key. So I'm gonna change it to 90922. Sometimes these errors, errors will ask you in a support ticket for the details. This little arrow under the arrow gives a little bit more information. Although many times these red summary error messages are enough to figure out what it means. So we changed the special cost center. I'm gonna click save and hopefully it'll work this time. A little blue bars completing it. <clears throat> and then if I go to, there's my grant fund that I just added. And you can see on my, that I must've pulled in the start and stop dates on this, on this grid. <clears throat> All right, so the expenditure accounts, probably more familiar with those. Are the, those are the ones that are used on transactions like purchase orders. Again, we can edit by using the pencil. We can view. When you edit an expenditure account, you can update the description or let it default to the auditor estate description. You can update the status, active or inactive, the start and stop dates, and that's all. Oops. When you clone, simply hit the clone button. You will have to update the new account and maybe start dates and stop dates. And if it's a grant fund that you're cloning, you'll definitely want to update the new special cost center. So I'm going to look at one particular account. And again, just in this top row, I start entering my account that I want to look at. When you're cloning it, again, those boxes here come into play. If you want to create another one and start with a fresh screen or close. Did not mean to close that. Budgeting, and ad budgeting adjustments, you would click under there, click create. 
I'm going to do it the beginning of February, make an adjustment for 10,000. Post. These grids are customizable too. If you made an error, and you it should have only been a thousand, you can delete it and start all over. So then when you close that box, you have the thousand initial deposit. Then it populates the totals on the account down below. If the user made several budget adjustments, there is a report that the user can use. It's called the SSDT budget transactions report. And you'll find that under the uh, report menu. But you can choose, like today is the 16th, you can choose to run your budget adjustments on one report for that day and save a copy if you'd like. So on this account, I'm gonna show you one more thing. Down below, future year encumbrance. A future encumbrance is an encumbrance on the account or on a purchase order that is dated in the future. So my current period, again, is February, 2021. But if I wanted to enter my purchase orders for June or even July, there is, this is where the account keeps track, the expenditure account keeps track of the future encumbrance. Once it, once that period is current, that purchase order future year encumbrance moves up to the current encumbered amount. The next line down here is the future year requisitions. Requisitions aren't encumbrances until they become, in, in, requisitions aren't encumbrances until they're converted into purchase orders. So, but, the system will track future year requisitions on the account as well, which is nice. So the user can have all their July 2021 requisitions entered ahead of time and this field is where it would be stored. And the last tab is the revenue accounts. As in any account, like on this grid, I think I might have mentioned this. When, when you're adding it, if you leave if the description blank and save it, it'll default to the AOS uh, description of that code. If I just click save, it'll populate what it's the general property tax unrestricted fund. And that's actually from the manual. And that's for any account on any of these grids or tabs. There is a rule um, used to create the default description, but it is optional. And if the user doesn't, if the user wants to disable it or customize it to suit the district's needs, they can disable the rule. So another couple tips on like this grid. Say I have a revenue account that I know it's the student wellness, but if I search here for student, all the student accounts are gonna come up like this um, student activity, student council, 
student uh, debate club. So, but I'm looking for the student wellness fund and I don't know the account. I can use wild cards and these are in the wiki, but the parentheses um, indicates I am looking for, I'm gonna surround the wellness around um, parentheses, not parentheses, percentage sign, I'm sorry. So by surrounding wellness around the percentage wild card, it'll bring me any account up with the word wellness in it. And I found my um, account that quick. So that's kind of nice. If I used, this will clear it out. I will show you the student one and what I mean by all these accounts. So that was a, you know, not a good search word. Because I got several. It wasn't easy to find the wellness one. Another thing you can do, active, you can just put T for true, find all your true active accounts. You can also put F, you can type in the word true. If you want to find um, any accounts, oops, greater than the fund 001, or anything less than, you can do that. Oh, I should have did anything less than 500 federal grants. So that would be the 001. There is another tip too. There's a scroll bar here. Well, so I go in all the accounts under the 500 accounts, you'll get the 003s, 004s, 006. So that's another tip to search. Um, you can also do like the special cost center 9920 period period 9921 and it'll bring you it'll bring up that range between 9920 and 9921 and once you have that if you just click on the row it'll put it all the 9920s together and the 9921s together and again, you can move that over as well. So it's very customizable, very user-friendly. Um, I think I've covered everything except for, here's one, the account query. So we're on the revenue tab. I'm gonna go back to that account I had. So the advanced query is just another way to further sort your options quickly. So once I click that button, these pop up over here. And I can drag them over and sort the grid below. So for instance, if I want to choose fun, I can drag it over and drop. So I'm gonna do fund equals 572. Then I'm gonna do the special cost center. I'm gonna use another one between 9,000 and just up into 9918, which generally would be like 2018. So all the grant count, up federal grant Title I accounts up through 2018. 
Once I do that, if I'm satisfied with that, if I apply query, those results are gonna show below here. I could have did the same thing without this query, but you see, I could get pretty extensive in my search and it'd be quick as that. Um, I can also do, Active equals false, apply query. And these are my inactive grant accounts. I can easily change it to true, hit the button again, and get my active accounts for those grants, ones that I might need to inactivate, for instance. You can also save this query. Once you enter it, whatever you wanna call it, and hit save, the next time you come in here, it would be under here. So I already have one saved, it's called the demo example, and it populates what I already sorted on earlier, or what I saved earlier, if that makes sense. So I've given you a lot of tips here and there. They're pretty, uh, these grid tips are throughout the system and can be used on all the grids. Here's a clear query that clears that. And then that hide takes it back to the menu. I think I've covered everything. And before I go to the next um, core menu, just want to make sure uh, that there's no questions. I don't see anything in the chat. If you guys have any questions, just let me know. Or if you think of it later too, you can let us know. So the next core menu option are bank accounts. This again is a setup page that contains the information for each bank account that the district uses. So I had set up one called the Demo National Bank. I'm gonna view it. Um, the bank account, you can enter whatever you want, you know, whatever the bank account uh, number is, the name of the account, the start date, stop date. And because you can have a list of like, say the payroll, well, different accounts, savings account, this check mark will tell the system that, that it's this bank account that um, the disbursements will be used with this default bank account. I kind of stumbled over that. Hopefully that makes sense. But that you'll, you'll have one default bank at least in this list. And once you set it up, it's set up. You can delete it. You can edit it. And it's as simple as that. The next setup menu option is delivery addresses. Now I only have one in this grid, but, and you notice there's no create button anywhere on the delivery address grid. And that's because you can't create a delivery address here. There are two ways to uh, create a delivery address. One is upon import from classic software, all the different addresses that were used on requisitions and purchase orders are brought in from classic software. So if you had, um, this is uh, 1795 Rains Park with an S. If you had another purchase order that somebody entered without the S, that would be this, 
and it would also be imported. So any variation of the address would be imported. And that's why during the um, migration process, we advise users go through to choose which ones they want to use. And again, I only have one in this demo instance, but I want to make this one active so I can use it when I'm entering um, a requisition, requisition or purchase order. When they are imported, they will come in as inactive by default. So again, that's why districts are asked to go through the list, choose which ones they want to use, and the user just simply checks on the active box for those to be used. There's not much under the um, more button, but I thought I'd show you. And that's all that's to the delivery addresses. The next menu option is OPUs or operational units. Operational units are what defines the district's facilities, buildings, departments. It's created and defined by the district and helps the district like, identify the costs because then they can use that part of the account code, the OPU, to, dis to sort either on a grid, on a report. Um, these are imported. So and it's this would be the OPU, the description, and the IRN, and whether or not it's central office. Again, it's these are imported in. It's might be a double check, but again, it's a one-time setup if it's new. organization menu option. Again, this is like the setup from classic screen or classic software, like under the USAS um, USA con screen. I believe it's screen one. And this is where you would enter the district's information, the address, the IDs, the federal IDs, the state vendor ID, in classic, it was advised at fiscal year end to check this data. Um, the user updated the square footage or the ITC IRN. Here, this is where it's kept in the redesign under organization on the menu option. So the district can actually update it anytime, click save and it'll be there either for now or later. But again, it needs to be filled in for a financial reporting period. The next option under the core menu are posting periods. Posting periods are a month in a fiscal year where a transaction can be created or updated. You do have to create a posting period and if you recall, February 2021, in the upper right corner, is our current posting period. And that's also indicated, besides up in the upper right corner, if the user has this option under core, the green bar indicates it's current too. Um, I see we don't have a March 2021, so I'm going to create it. Click create. This is a drop down. I'm going to pick March. The calendar year is 2021. If I want to make it current for that green bar or the upper right corner, I would click current. But I'm going to leave it as February for now and just click create. So now you can see over here, it was created at 945, March 16th. I opened up period of March. So we see a couple of different icons here. Um, and again, hovering tips help. 
this file folder that's like indicated as an open position indicates an open period. This is a closed period. The file folder is closed. And if you want to make March current, you would click that check mark and the green bar would now be on March and this would indicate March. If you close January, it'll put like a date close like here. Uh, let's see if I've covered everything. You can have more months open. You can have the whole fiscal year open. But I'll tell I'll give you a warning about that in a minute. First, a purchase uh, posting period has to be open, like March, like I opened March before I can post a transaction in March. It doesn't necessarily have to be current. I can have March open and I can post a requisition in March, even though my period, my current period is February. So this allows like the accounts payable clerk to continue on while the treasurer works on balancing February, for instance. Again, it's flexibility in the redesign. So posting periods must be open to post a transaction to a month, but it doesn't have to necessarily be current. And here's a good example, I guess. If, if any of you guys have worked in manual accounting, like in the old days, or you can envision this with paper manual accounting, each month had its own book of records or a folder with all the entries, all the reports for February, um, all the journal entries for February. And even though it's March, I had to go get the physical book and open the book or open the file folder before I could post any entries into that book. This is the same concept. Before I can post anything in December, I have to open the period of December or I have to open the period of July to actually post it. Even though the current month is February. Again, the current month is indicated up here and on the counts and reports, that is the current period that's gonna reflect on the month to date figures and the fiscal year to date figures on accounts and reports. So even though it is March, if I run an outstanding purchase order report, for example, the current encumbrances by default is gonna pick February because the parameter on that report is current encumbrances and current encumbrances is the current period of February. So even though I said you can have the whole fiscal year open, users should be advised that having a period open allows transactions to be posted to that. So you might have, let's just say all these months are open, but the treasurer actually balanced July. Um, by having it open, the user that's entering requisitions or purchase orders in the high school has access to enter a transaction in July, even if it was an error it's gonna throw off July's balancing. So what we advise is to close the period soon after it's balanced for the month, like January is still open, but if this was in the real world, it's probably getting close to closing it because it is already March. You can delete a period as long as there are no transactions attached to the period. And you would simply just click an X, click this X. 
So any questions on that? I don't see any, so I'm gonna go to the next menu option, projects. And projects were also used in classic um, and it would be project to date information that was tracked on the accounts in classic. Sometimes these are used like for building projects that may go on for more than one fiscal year. So you have the ability to track that whole period across fiscal years. You can bring period to date figures in on with like on grids with the more button. You can pull these figures into reports, but we're gonna create one. There's one project for each cash account. So let's create a project. I hit create. I'm gonna call it the athletic stadium project. I don't have a beginning balance right now because we're starting from scratch. These grayed out figures are gonna populate once you assign the account to it. Uh, the start date is started last year in January. And I don't know when it's gonna end, so I'm gonna just leave it open-ended. Actually, let's put in 2022 and click save. Now again, those fields aren't gonna be populated until you assign the cash account to it. So as soon as this little blue bar is done, we have a new icon on this grid and it's to assign the cash account. So you see the athletic stadium has been added, but there is no amounts populated on this grid either because it's not assigned yet. So all you do, if you make an error, you can delete it. But to assign it, you click on the dollar sign and you can either scroll, but I know this is an 003 um, fund and that would take forever to keep scrolling. I mean, it could, I mean, I saw it quickly, but I was gonna give you another tip too. And this is, can be used in several areas of the software too. I'm sorry, this tip wasn't appropriate at this time. Forget what I said about that. If I start um, entering 003, my 003 funds come up, I can choose one, hit assign. And once this blue bar is done, I should have these amounts populated. I go into I assign the wrong account. So I simply went back in, reassigned the correct account. And now the athletic stadium project to date expended populates, project to date received populates. And if you view it, it shows the same thing. So that can be handy on different project tracking. If you had a beginning balance, it also tracks and calculates the ending balance. If you had projects come over from Classic, they will be tracked down here, legacy expended and legacy received and encumbered. Okay, we got one more option on this transaction or this core menu. 
And then maybe we'll take a break and then go to the transaction menu. So this is um, this vendor grid is the replacement for Classics Venn screen or USAS Web's vendor option. So you can see the grid looks this familiar. I can pull up my active vendors or my inactive vendors by putting false. I'm gonna look at a vendor. Pull one up so we can see one. Vendor numbers, they can be assigned. They can be auto assigned. I mean, they can be entered, you know, specifically. They can be auto assigned. The primary name would be um, I wanted to Sorry. In classic memo vendors started with nines. In redesign, a vendor is not required during a requisition or PO processing, but a vendor will be required at invoicing. <laughs> but you would enter the name. This would indicate active or not. If you wanted to change it to active, you would click active. If the vendor had an account number, say Office Max, you can enter the account number if you choose. Default payment type is whether they're paid by a check or electronic payment. You can enter their email address. The grayed out totals are calculated in the system. You have the 1099 fields in this section. This would be ignore limits set by the IRS, which is 600 currently. This is a drop down. You would enter the tax ID type, whether it's a social security number or a EIN number for the company. This is where actually you write, put in that social security number. And then this is a drop down of all the types of 1099s that you would pick. The new hire section right here, reportable or non-reportable. This will automatically check when the system uh, reports the information. You can enter the social security number of the vendor here their birth date if known, the beginning date of the contracts, and how many months the contracts are for. And then there's other information down here. If it's a minority vendor, you can click if they're tracking that. You can click here if um, the vendor needs to withhold child support based on the new hire requirements, notification. There is an opportunity that we won't be going through today, but there is an opportunity to actually customize fields on your vendor record and maybe um, enter, you can make a box for W9 on file, for instance. But we're not gonna show you that today. And then down here are locations. A location is uh, an address. The user can designate multiple addresses or locations. They can have a default purchase order location. They can have an address for the check address. They can have a different address for the 1099 location. And by entering the check address, you can name your location, primary or check, the name of the vendor, the address, phone. And over here on the right, you can indicate if it's a purchase order or 
the, this location should be used for a purchase order or just for the check. Sometimes the check address is different than the 1099 or purchase order address. <coughs> and you were just in the user would just indicate it by checking or unchecking. <coughs> If they want to add a new location, you just click on that plus sign and another one comes up. And if that was just an error, you can delete it. Uh, let's see. Oh, I uncheck the PO box. You have that create new and close option here. You can perform vendor adjustments if needed. Um, you can enter whatever you need as a description or whatever, whether it's taxable or not in the amount. So if I put $10 and post it, it posts it and keeps it on this grid for the future. So then when I just, when anybody goes in there, the description would be right there. So that's handy. Uh, if you are always running the same grid results and you want to save a report because you're always doing the same one, you can click on the report button. And down here, there's a save as, Pat's daily report, and save the report. And then that report becomes available on the report menu for you to get the same results daily. Also on these grids, say, I'm gonna show you another tip. You can sort multiple columns at once. So if I want to add first sort um, by active, put true on top, and then the city, I can put, I'm looking for all vendors with the city of Adele. When you get this excessive query, this is when it's a good time to further down your sort by using the advanced query. As, as you see, I did it by just choosing non-active vendors because I knew there wasn't that many non-active vendors in the city of Adele. But you can see how that further um, sorted it down. Now the other recent release, we had a new release recently to import vendors. So you see this import button. This allows the user to import vendors using a CSV file to either add a vendor or to modify the vendor's record. So this is sweet and you would simply First, I'm going to show you in the documentation under, sorry, under mass load vendors, there's a vendor import criteria. There is also a template spreadsheet that you can download. 
and it has all your headers already set up. So if you use Safari, this is similar, but easier. So, and then you would just fill in your information. In here, in the wiki, it gives you what's required, what's acceptable. Like this has to be exactly as it is typed. So using that, you go back to the instance, click import, and I'll show you an example. I have a file already saved. I choose it and you see it here. Once I hit load, oh, I should have showed you the file. So this is what, well, that's not it. This is a file that I am uploading. I entered the next vendor number. If you left, leave it on blank, it'll auto populate. The vendor's name is Groomer. The count number I just made up. I want it to be an active vendor. This should be check. Ignore limits, that's in regards to the 1099. Uh, section on the vendor. This tax ID, the 1099 section, the birth date, new hire. So all this information can be imported. So that's the file that I hit. And you see that once it loads in, the records, it'll tell you records loaded one, error zero. If I had an error, it would show on the, on the output file. Output file is USAS load error. I have no errors. But if I go to my vendor, my new vendor has been added. So the account number, the primary name, these populated, the birth date populated, the address is populated. So that's a quick way. You can also use this to inactivate vendors. But the trick is to follow this and what is required. And that can be easily found under the core menu under venue vendors and the vendor import criteria. So any questions on that? Well, this seems like a good time before we go to the transaction menu. Um, and we'll go through all those menu options. Seems like a good time to take a break. We can meet here like at 1025. We'll take a 15 minute break, stretch, get some coffee, um, do some jumping jacks, wake up. Hopefully I didn't bore you. And I'll be back in 15 minutes. Okay. Hopefully everybody is back. So we went through the core. Now we're gonna to go to the transaction menu. And although this menu is alphabetical, I thought about going through it like through the expenditure process starting with like requisition. So I'm gonna jump around, but it's gonna flow because it's the expenditure process. I'm going to go to the requisition. This is a requisition grid, similar icons. 
with a new one, print. So if I wanted to print, I would this one, or if I wanted to print a batch, I could either choose the icon or up here. Same thing with converting. These are requisitions. If I wanted to convert this oops, or a batch, I would just click convert. I have the option to pick the date. and click post. It shows me that one's converted, zero failed. And now it displays the PO on the grid. To get a quick uh, list of those that are still in need to be converted, this converted field or column can be set to false. And these would be the requisitions that still need to be converted if approved. You wanna see all of them? You could leave it blank or just filter by true. You can edit a requisition up until it's converted. Once it's converted, it's a purchase order and the requisition can't be edited. Uh, so let's go to create one. Again, you have the create new or close. I'm gonna close it after I save it. You can enter your own requisition series or have it auto assign or even have a prefix, but we'll discuss requisition prefixes, I believe on day two when looking under the, the system menu. So I'm just gonna let it auto assign. You can tab or click with the mouse to get to these fields. And as I enter the date, if I wanna see the current period, you can move this box out of the way to see it up in the right-hand corner. The vendors is a drop down, or you can start typing the first couple letters of the vendor. You can also use wildcards for any vendor. I take that back, that's on the grid. So we are going to enter Oxford Travel. Description, this would be um, what is in the header of the requisition or purchase order as it gets converted. Regarding the vendor, you can have a non-vendor specific requisition if this vendor field is left blank. When this is converted, it will be marked as a multi-vendor because it has no vendor. Um, when multi-vendors come into the redesign, when they're imported, they come in as inactive. So an imported requisition or an imported purchase order that contains a multi-vendor is now being migrated over to the redesign with the vendor removed, like here, and the PO or the rec checked as a multi-vendor here. 
So behind the scenes, it does it all for you. So classic multi-vendor PO that comes into the redesign can still be invoiced and assigned a vendor at the time of processing the invoice. The deliver by date, you can enter the date or use the calendar. Remember we talked about uh, delivery addresses under the core menu. The drop down will contain all the different vendors or the, sorry, the drop down will contain all the addresses that are available to use. And you notice in this drop down, I have two. And it's because one of them is different than the other one. I don't know, I don't see how, but that's why there's two. That populates down here once chosen. You can enter the terms if, if the user wants. Attention to um, the person that it's going to. Type um, is an optional PEX field. This may be utilized by districts that might use third party approval systems. This converted check mark will automatically check itself when, it's, when this requisition is converted. The template check mark is it's to save this. Yeah, if checked, it'll save it. So it remains on the system for the future use. I'm not gonna do a template. So now we're at the bottom where you enter the items in the requisition. You click on the plus. This is similar to the USAS web entry, I believe. Um, this would delete an item. This would add an item. This copies an item. So let's enter one. Here's another tip. Um, you can start typing the fund and that fund account codes start popping up. And similarly, as you continue on with the account code, it further narrows it down. Several places in the system. You can also remember the TI for is O2 for expenditures. You can search it by the TI slash and then start with the fund. I'm going to choose supplies. I could either add another line item. And let's copy it. So it copies the book. This one's 15, same account number. Um, I can move this to the top if I want Dr. Seuss's book to be listed first on the purchase order or I can move it down. You see how those just reorganized itself. And just like in USAS web, you can split the purchase order or requisition by price or quantity. And how you would do that is this little icon. This would be split by quantity this would be split by price. So let me show you one. First, I'm going to split by quantity. I have five items. Um, I have five pans at $100.
I split by quantity. It opens up a pop-up. I want three to go to food service. Oops. I want to add another item because these quantity has to add up to five. So I want two more pans to go to the high school. And up here is a summary. I got a quantity of five, which I'm splitting down here. Unit price 100, total 500. Except, oops. I can either edit or close. And you see it's split down here to show you split by price. You notice here above, this is split by price. But down here, you only have the choice to split by quantity. That's because when you're splitting by price, you can only have one quantity. You have one and then you're taking that item and splitting it. So to add one, I'm gonna start with one. And I'm gonna say it's a copier. So I have one copier, but since it's in the high school, I'm gonna charge the athletic department in the high school as well as the high school department code. So that one copier is $500. And then I'm gonna split it 250. for the athletic, 250 for using the copier to the high school, accept, close. And that's how I split one copier between two accounts to split the cost for sharing that copier. So I have that requisition, it all looks good. I have this check mark to close. So this box here should close when I click save. Um, pull up my unconverted requisitions. You see that one here. If I view it, you see that's the one that I entered. I'm gonna check mark the ones I wanna convert. Click convert. You have the date. I'm just gonna pick the current date. However, you got to remember that to post a transaction, it's got to be in an open period, which we did have March open because we created that posting period, if you recall. So I'm going to leave the PO date blank and it defaults to today. I'm going to leave the default PO blank so it defaults to auto assign. The district has the ability to configure these PO numbers, which will be under the system menu on day two. So I'm going to post. There'll be a pop up to show how many converted, two, how many failed, zero, and any warnings or errors. We got a lot of negative balances. I'm going to close that window. And then those two requisitions that I just converted will now be on the purchase order grid, which is the next step in the 
expenditure process. You see that non-specific requisition converted to a non-vendor specific purchase order here and that one that I converted as well. You have a new icon on this grid and it's the invoice button. So if you want to invoice this particular purchase order, you click the invoice button And you can do that, but we're gonna walk through that in the next step of the expenditure process. Um, so back to the purchase order grid. I can here, I can print my purchase order by checking the ones I want to print and click and print. I have the option to run it XML or PDF if I choose PDF, there's a default PO form. And then there is the ability to customize your purchase order in many forms in the system. Hold on, I just dropped my mouse. Or the mouse jumped off. Um, so you have the ability to customize like forms within the system. And you see here, I do have that option and it's a customized purchase order form. Now I'm gonna show you that on day three when we're talking about reports and templates, but I'll go ahead and choose that so you can see it. This particular one, I believe has a logo on the purchase order. So you see the logo name here. So you can do something similar with that just by customizing a form, which we'll talk about Thursday. But to give you uh, what the default looks like, it's similar, it's just without the icon. So here's the default, here's one that I customized. So again, it's the flexibility in the redesign. I showed you how to print. This is the non-specified vendor purchase order. Uh, let's look at one that has been converted. So I'm gonna view this one. I'm gonna edit it so it makes it darker. So this purchase order, as you see, is gonna contain many of the fields or all of the fields that was on the requisition. It's gonna have the assigned purchase order name, number, the date, the vendor that you entered, the posted date, um, the dates on top. This date here is when it was entered or converted and created. This date is when it was actually entered. And this modified date is when a PO is either edited or amended, it tracks that date. So you can see a user can go in there and see the last time the purchase order is, has been edited or amended. And then you have a posted date. This is often used, I believe, with the third-party applications. It's automatically populated to the created date for new purchase orders and then be updated to the modified date if the PO is edited or amended. Um, the source here is actually the requisition number that comes in, let's not pick the one that I entered.
So this is the one that we entered. There's the requisition number. This will be automatically checked if the purchase order is still invoiceable and still open to allow invoicing against it. This will be checked if you, um, it'll all be automatically be checked when, and the user will receive a warning when invoicing is prior to the purchase order date. So if you did have some then and nows and you're at the purchase order grid and you want to know what are your all your then and now purchase orders, say for a board meeting to get them approved. If you don't already have it on your grid, we're on the purchase order grid. You can go to the more button and pull it in. Check mark then and now. It'll be then on the grid. You can filter to true for any then and nows. And your grid will populate with those purchase orders that need the then and now approval. You under the edit, you have a couple options here. And all I did was click the pencil and you have a or edit. You would use edit if the purchase order has not been sent to the vendor. Remember, a purchase order is that contract between you and the vendor. So if the vendor already has that purchase order, you really shouldn't be editing it once it's in their hands. So you can, if it hasn't been sent to the vendor and it's still sitting on your desk, you can edit the purchase order. Um, when you edit, only the fields that can be modified will be shown. You can modify that. You can't modify the create date. You can't modify the items. When you edit or amend, sorry. <coughs> amend is used if the purchase order has already been sent to the vendor. So when you click amend, you can see that some options change. You can no longer change the vendor name because the vendor should already have it in their hands. You can change, um, So you can't change the vendor. And you, um, you can't change the vendor if the purchase order already has been invoiced or paid or if the purchase order is in a closed period. So for example, I'm gonna pull up a purchase order. You can see it's dated in October and October's a closed posting period. So you no longer have the ability to edit, but you can possibly amend the purchase order, but only fields that allow you to update it will allow you you can't change the vendor. Let me show you another. You can see I don't have the ability to edit this one. So instead, 
you can use the copy feature. Copy the item that you want to change. Create the new item. You can um, change your information that you need to update it. And then you'll be able to cancel the first line. Once you cancel that first line, it'll reflect a line through that line crossing it out. Another new release recently was the purchase order repair. This is similar to, there was a tool tip too. This allows the user to change accounts and unpaid charges. To change, you are allowed to change the vendor or the date on an unpaid purchase order. This is similar to the Verify Invoice Program in Classic. So when you click Repair, you have three tabs that allow you to either change the account from this account to that account, and it reflects down here. You can change the vendor to update it to that vendor and hit Update. Or you can change the purchase order date by either entering it or using the calendar. Once you click update, it will update it as long as the PO and the purchase order charge doesn't have any payments against it. So, the next process in the expenditure process is to create an AP invoice. You can create it by clicking the invoice icon or, and that'll take you right into the invoice screen similar to US, um, USAS web, that or you can go to the AP invoice grid, which we're sitting at now, which is reflected right here. So if I pulled up that purchase order that I want to um, hit create, purchase order that I want to invoice is that number. It brings me to the invoice template. The date that you would enter or the date is gonna default to the current date. If you want to enter the date from the physical invoice here, you can, as long as it's in an open period. So if you recall, we're in February is the current period. Um, if you have an invoice from December, December must be an open period. So that's why this field was created. You can enter the current date but the vendor's invoice date was really December. By doing this, this field doesn't require the current posting period to be open. And if you enter a date before, you'll get that warning about it then and now. I can enter the payment due if you wish. I can click the top row and select all to fill. Full. I can clear, oops, clear them all. Or I can individually say the invoice only invoice those things. So I could fill that line, but this line was only sent 
partial. So my options are here. The receive date is often used towards end of the fiscal year and after. And these would be the date that the items were received. So you would enter that and the count name, the count number is to the right. And if it's an inventory item, you can check that. Once you save, oh, perfect. This is the warning. The vendor invoice date is prior to the purchase order date. This was cause the purchase order to be marked then and now. So it gives the user a warning. So here's the invoice. Um, this partial button, it's called an action button. Now we're looking at the invoice for the purchase order. I wanted to change this line item from partial to a full status. Say I'm not going to receive the other $5,000 worth of a merchandise and I want to change it to full, I would click this button. If I want to change this to a partial payment, I would change it here because you see here, I filled this AP invoice as full. If I want to change it to partial, I would change it here. As easy as that. This was originally a partial. I want to make it a full, completely paid, and it changes it. The posting period for that invoice has got to be open too when you're doing that, just like the Verify Invoice Program in Classing. I'm not sure if I showed you this, but that then and now can be pulled into the grid for any purchase orders. I did show you that by adding that to the grid and clicking report. So these are the invoices that are have been entered. The next process is to create a payable or go to the payable menu. A payable is a processed invoice, but an unpaid invoice. So in classic, it was like the invoice list or the check proc, but in a grid format. So on this grid, You have a few grouping options that lets the user choose what they want to group these invoices by. You can group them by vendor. And this is, I believe, how the check proc worked. You get a total, a grand total for the vendor. Or you can do it by detail, which You see the grand total for Gene Hubbard for 443. This is total by vendor. If you go under the detail for Gene Hubbard, and I'm going to sort these by clicking the arrow so all the Gene Hubbards are together. Her total of 440 something was actually four invoices. So if you only wanted to pay two, you could process just two of those Gene Hubbard um, invoices. If you wanted to do all of them, you could just choose it by clicking it under the vendor tab. tab. So let's post and go to, I'm gonna do just some of Gene's and Rome de de development. So I'm gonna post selected. A pop-up comes up. I have two vendors, two invoices, a total amount that you can verify. 
the disbursement date is, I'm going to make it February 28th. And you can group them by vendor or invoice. And again, remember we set up under the core menu, the bank account to be used. This is where it comes into play. So this disbursement is going to be created from the demo national bank. I'm going to click post and it's actually going to um, post the disbursement for these two vendors that you can continue on to print. And this takes you to the next process of the expenditure process, which is the disbursement grid, which can be found by also going through the menu. So we've looked at the requisition, converted it to a purchase order, invoiced under AP invoice, chose it under the payables, and process the disbursements. And now on the disbursement grid, this is where the user can print or create the print file for the disbursement that they created. So we have a couple new buttons. So first I'm gonna talk about the grid. Over here, you can click show printable. And this will, if clicked, it will show any disbursements that are outstanding but have no check number assigned. So if I wanted to see a quick view of the ones that I need to assign, it would be here. If I wanted to see all of them, I would leave it unchecked. We've talked about these other buttons, but we also can pull up a check number by sorting like that. Even with one with a check number, we can reprint it by checking and generating the print file. You can, you notice my Rome development and Gene Hubbard disbursement that I that we created. One's electronic and one's a check. You can process both of these in the same batch. Another flexibility of the redesign. So if I want to generate it, I first check disbursements I want to print. I'm going to let the starting number default, leave that by vendor number. If I want my electronic checks for that Gene Hubbard, I need to check mark that. Again, the XML file sometimes works with the third party vendors. If you want a PDF, it gives you the choice to either have a default form or a custom form. We're going to go with the default generate the file. This is what your check file looks like with the check number and just what a check file looks like or check looks like. Um, so now you see on the grid that this Gene Hubbard has an electronic check number assigned as well as um, Rome development has the previous check number assigned. You notice that electronic checks and check numbers no longer have like different series of checks. You can also reconcile the check from this grid with a date simply by checking button. It gives you the total amount reconciled, how many, how many failed. You can also, and then it all um, reflect or reconcile. You can also check it 
and unreconcile it because you really meant to do another check. So then that comes up as outstanding again. This is similar to the classic um, RCN CLE program, the reconcile program. Um, in the redesign though, electronic checks do need to be reconciled. Uh, you also can, you have an auto reconcile button here. This is, um, this allows you, the user to get a file from the bank to like use with our system to reconcile the checks like in a whole batch. So that's available. There is more setup required for this to be used, but this would be discussed when showing you the utility menu later in the week. And then if you have this check, Rome development, that you want to void, like the classic program void check, you check the check that you want to void, click void. You have <clears throat> by default, this void invoice items will be checked, which cancels the associated invoice items, which was similar to classic. Um, but if desired, you can uncheck it. So for example, um, if it's unchecked, the invoice items would not be voided. Uh, so you might have a situation where a check should not have been issued yet the invoice information is okay. The treasurer just didn't want to put that check in the mail for whatever reason. There's not enough money in the bank. We'll just say that. So the, the invoice is okay, but the check just wasn't ready to be cut. So the user can actually void the check, uncheck this box, um, and it'll place the invoices back in under the payable grid to be processed later. So that was the Rome development. So even though we cut the check, we voided it, the invoice is fine, we're just gonna pay it next week. It can sit out here till next week when we choose it and post it again. I'm gonna post it again. Another example of when not to void the invoice items is if the invoice amount was wrong. So I could void this check, uncheck this box, and then go and edit the invoice to the correct amount, save the changes. And then you don't have to recreate the new invoice. It saves time because you're just modifying the invoice because the invoice was the, just had a wrong um, amount. Same thing with the date. Um, so I dated this void. Let's view this void for Rome development. I voided it on, I'll make this darker. Well, you can see I voided it today, 316. If I want to change the void date, I would just change the date here because it should have been voided in February, for instance, and save it. And now it's been updated. So that's an option too. Um, another example would be you, well, I guess I just showed you that you accidentally voided 
a January disbursement. Let's find a January disbursement. Here's a January disbursement. I voided it using a February date. We'll move that over to. And it should have been uh, a January date. So to change that again, view it, change the void date. And it's as simple as that. You do have to have that posting period open because again, transactions require an open posting period. So here are my grid. An example, I guess I talked about that example, let's see. Are there any questions so far? The other button on this uh, grid is the resequence. This was similar to the process used in check sequence in Classic, and it allows the user to change the check numbers on the checks that are currently posted, or to change the check numbers because they used the wrong series, or to void, or when they do change the check numbers, the old checks are changed. So. That works similar. You enter your original check number, your new check number, whether or not you want to void old checks and then enter the void date, validate and post. Um, let's see. The activity ledger query. This is like the EIO, EIEIO options in Classic, which I loved, but this is even better. Um, or like some of the query screens in USAS Web. But it's all, it's all these transactions like purchase orders, invoices, disbursements, refunds, all rolled into this grid all right here. And more can be pulled in or sorted by this more button or like we talked about the advanced query. A new icon that appeared on this grid is this, which um, it, you can increase your grid results up to 2000 or keep it lower, um, but that controls the range of records that are going to be displayed. Normally, it's defaulted lower and it improves the responsiveness of the grid loading. So looking at this grid, again, it pulls in all types of transactions. So if I wanted to search a date range for checks or purchase orders, I, in the date column, um, let's say I want all the checks for July, I would enter 07 slash 01 slash 20, period, period, 731, 20. Once I move off that field, oops, I didn't make, did it? The grid results are going to show you any activity between those dates. So just to jump to show you that it actually brought in more than 731. Either way, that's one way to sort. Um, and with the two periods, two dots between the dates, it gives you the range for those transactions between the dates. Uh, you can also clear that. 
see all the transactions on a particular purchase order. Again, I use this under Classics Oink. <laughs> so if I pulled up the purchase order 215166, I'm going to move my type column closer. You can see in this column, it, this purchase order is invoiceable. The amounts, this is where your um, tricks work too. If I want to sort this by the type, so purchase order first, I would just click that top row and it would sort purchase order invoice disbursements. If I just want to see just the invoices, I can type it in that type in just those columns. Um, so I want to sort by date first. I click on that column. It's um, in order. If I want to sort by another column, I would use that shift and then click the second row that I want to. Well, that wasn't a good example. So sort by date and then sort by type next. And a good example would have been the PO item. If you had more PO items numbers here, the sort number two would work on that column. So you could also see how many, what checks are against this PO by just pulling up the disbursements and seeing the check numbers. So there's many things that you can do from this grid um, as you can pull in even receipt items, refund items. And then, like I said before, anything that's on the grid can be pulled into a report. The next item that we are going to go over are the receipts. Um, similar grid to the other grids, I'm going to create a grid. The date. I'm going to let the receipt number populate who I received it from, the description, library, line number one. We're going to start over. I don't know what I hit. Again, you click the plus sign to add an item. Uh, whatever you want to enter as a description. Here is where you would pick a receipt or a redu reduction of expenditure. You would use RC for receipt and RX for reduction of expenditure. Um, and you would use the reduction of expenditure when you're trying to reduce an expenditure, expenditure account. So we're going to enter a receipt. A student paid 10 bucks. And if you start typing, you will get your account codes. That you can enter. You can also click on that icon. As you know, that it's 1890 and that narrows it down down here and how much is uh, marked to be received. Save, again, you can use these if you want. I'm gonna close after I save. 
By clicking here, you have the ability to print a receipt. XML or PDF, and again, you can customize a receipt form like I showed you the example of the purchase order form with the logo on it. If you print it, it looks similar to the USAS web receipt with all the information, library fine. Um, say for example, I created a receipt this month and now I realize the amount is wrong. There is no reverse option here. You don't see any icon to do that. Um, currently there is not a um, reverse option. So what you would do is uh, enter a new one. Edit this, say it should have been $50 and save it. Another new feature that's just recent is the ability to import receipts by, and the receipt file would be in the CSV format. So in the wiki, again, under transaction, receipts, there's this receipt import criteria with that template spreadsheet. I'm gonna open the one that I have that I'm gonna import so I can show you. So first to give you an idea what the file I'm importing looks like, <clears throat> based on these criterias in the wiki. I entered my CSV spreadsheet of two, I, well, the first one's a receipt with the type RC for a receipt. The second one I wanna import is the reduction of expenditure. So I used the code um, RX. You can do the item description the amount, the full account code. Notice that on a receipt, it uses the receipt code on the reduction of expenditure type RX. It uses the expenditure code. I'm not sure if I said that right. The receipt uses the revenue code. The reduction of expenditure uses the expenditure code. So I'm gonna leave the receipt number blank, so it auto assigns. Go back to the instance. When I hit the import button and choose my file, I verify I have the right file, I click load. The pop-up is gonna give me two records loaded, no errors. It does give me a file, it's called USAS load error, but it's gonna tell me no errors record loaded. If it gave, a, gave me an error, it would have all the information that I had entered and then the error at the end of what it, why it errored out. And if that error is not clear, you can contact us sometimes. Um, they're not as clear cut as what we like them to be. So records loaded, zero errors. If you look on the grid, it's these two that were um, Dr. Susan bookstore that I entered. I'm gonna put these back in order. So it populated the next number. Um, I think that's it on this. I don't see any questions. So I'm going to go to the next item called refunds.
similar grid, create a refund. You can create a refund to be processed with the check or without a check. Um, you can clone a refund and I'll show you that in a minute when it catches up with me. I'm gonna click close. I'm gonna let it auto populate the or auto assign. I'm gonna change this for February because I'm still in the month of February. Refunded to me or books. I wanna create a check, you would check here. This is where that bank account that we set up under the core menu comes into play. It's coming to the demo national bank. If I have a vendor that I want to um, enter, and then I can enter my items. So $10 fee with the account, click save. When it is checked to create a check, the refund actually goes to the disbursement page. So you see this top line has no check number. I'm gonna scoot it over. That's the one I created. I am gonna to go to the disbursement page You see my refund with no check number. I would click that, generate the print file. It wasn't electronic, so. And there's my refund check, as simple as that. Um, Currently, you can't reverse a refund, but there is a JIRA issue created and you can, there's a workaround. You can enter a negative refund to cancel out the original refund and balance out. So as that blue line comes, catches up with me, I think, um, I got a couple more options here, pending transactions and transfers and advances. I'm gonna to go to transfers and advances first. When you click create, you have the ability again to click create or close. First, I'm gonna create a transfer in the amount of $5,000 dated in February. I'm gonna to transfer to the cafeteria fund. Now only the amounts or only the accounts that are available is gonna show. I'm gonna use the general transfer fund and then it's going to the transfers in food service. So those are the accounts. There's a magnifying glass. If you're not sure of the total account, you can just click the fund and get what you want. I'll just search. So click save. It, because I had this box checked, it populates another one. And here I'm gonna click advance. I'm gonna create an advance for, we'll just do 5,000 again. Advance to apartment. The only counts that will show are the ones that are available. And this is based on the Auditor of State Manual Account Codes, like 7410. 
the credit account is going to be, I'm going to be advancing the principal account. I'm going to change this advance to principal. This is my last transaction, so I'm going to change my check mark to close this box when I click save. So there I've added an, a transfer and an advance. And you can see the description shows the amount, the account debited and the account credited all on this graph or grid. You can generate a report, you can pull in more columns. When I view the, I clicked on advance, the one that we created to advance the principal account. I'm gonna view it and edit it so that it's a little bit darker and then explain a little bit about what we're seeing. So to repay, I'm gonna, Close that. To repay, down here is the repayment section. So we advance the principal account $5,000. And as time goes on, we're going to have to repay that advance. To, to repay that advance, all you would go to is that advance, view it. Down here is the check mark to create the repayment. And I'm going to pay back only partial. Pay half, save. And it's going to keep track down here. So the next time, on March 1st, pay paid in full. These could be as descriptive as the district wants. I'm just making it generic. If you made a um, error and you applied this to the wrong advance, you can simply delete it. And it's gone. So I'm going to pull up one that shows all paid and it's gray, but if you can see three payments to repay the amount of 1,000 that was given on January 1st, it came from this account, went into that account for student managed advances. And then the student, uh, student managed account paid back the general fund in three installments. And again, oh, and this, you can't see the full account. So earlier I said, if you see a box that might have some stuff on to the right of it, if you click this plus side, it will open up the box. I guess that was the end of it, but you get the point and then close it back up. Um, when you have a day like here on 228 that you have made a lot of advances and transfers, there is a report under the report menu that's called the transfer advance activity report that the user can run and um, narrow down the report just for that day if they want to save the day's transaction for all the transfers and advances that they made on that particular day. And the other option, menu option, I think this is the last one. We've gone through, oh, we got this one and pending transactions, okay. So let's go to pending transactions first. This is like the classics auto post option, basically. Um, this pending transaction menu option under transaction is 
are files that come from a different system or a different software waiting to be posted to USAS. An example would be the payroll file like you see here. It's the February 28th payroll file. Another example would be like your board distribution file or your board retirement file that gets created on the USPS side and then it's populated over here. Once it's populated on the USAS side, then we have to process it. So this edit button, open that up. The user has the ability to post it, reject it, or validate it. Um, when you reject it, it sends a message back to the USPS side and removes this file from our pending transaction grid so that it could be corrected like on the USPS side. Once it's corrected on the USP side, then they submit it back over to us on the US USAS side. We can come here, open it up, and process it. Um, when it is a payroll file like this, it processes or it posts and creates the expenditures automatically. When it's the board distribution file or the board retirement file, um, when, it, when the pending transaction is posted, it creates the purchase order where then the district user can then invoice that and generate the disbursement and assign the check number. And then when they do that, they can uh, check that electronic box if desired or leave it unchecked to produce a check. But we're going to post this. This is the payroll file. I'm going to change it because it was actually the 28th payroll. Again, that's where the bank account from the core menu populates. We had one bank set up, Demo National Bank. And I'm going to click post. Oh, it doesn't like my date. Okay, we're going to pick the 26th. It gives me a warning that there's a negative balance for a cash account. But as it gets posted, your pending transaction is cleared out. If you view this under the disbursements, um, the type, again, you can put P for payroll and bring up your electronic check that you chose not to print. But you can print. if you wanted to. This was an electronic check. So um, many times electronic checks are not generated a check. So as you see, the pending transaction file is empty now. Any questions on that? And last is I believe we hit everything except for the distribution and error corrections. This would be like classics account modification or account ACMOD, A-C-T-M-O-D, ACMOD. It's where distribution or error correction options was in classic and this is where it can be found in redesign under the transaction menu. To create one, um, in redesign, you don't need to, it doesn't require a vendor, it doesn't require a purchase order, and it doesn't require a check. However, the user does have the ability to put this in like the description. So the distribution number, 
Um, this is where I was saying you could be PO one, two, three, four, and then the reason why, if you wanted to, you could put as much description as you want. The grayed out boxes are automatically filled. This is where you would enter your items and maybe another description. Add another item, enter your description. And what I'm doing here is taking $10 from this account and moving it to the supplemental 113 account. The net effect here must be zero. Is what, that's what you're doing, you're swapping, you're just fixing accounts. So this would be used when you're wanting to correct an entry for an expenditure charged to the wrong account, for example. The, um, in that case, you really don't need to avoid the check. All it was was the wrong account. So you would come here and correct the accounts and in the description, you could put to correct check number I67. You could put whatever your description is, but that would fix um, the account that was erroneously applied to the wrong expenditure account without voiding the check. When you're fixing a on expenditure account, like I did here, even though it looks like I'm doing wages, um, you'll want the positive amount for the incorrect amount, that's the wrong account, and you're moving it negative amount to, um, to the correct account, kind of backwards. When you're fixing, like say a receipt that was posted to the wrong account, you'll want to enter the positive amount for the correct account and the negative amount for the incorrect account. And again, you can um, refer to the wiki for clarification on that as well too. Um, I think that's everything that I planned on going over. I'll, uh, if anybody has questions, please let me know now. Tomorrow, Amanda will be going through the budgeting menu options, the periodic menu options, the extract menu, and the system menu. So if there are no questions, I hope you guys all have a wonderful day and I hope you guys all come back for tomorrow's um, training as well. And remember, this will be saved out on the training page as well. So you can access this recording anytime you'd like. Thank you and have a good day.